what is happening now with with this so i'm thinking you know for me it started with the whole sustainability because being being somebody that is you know reached the 50 bracket suddenly you have a lot more youngsters in the building right who are also looking for companies effectively working with sustainability uh, and naturally today i mean every company has sustainability as one of their corporate goals so um as a ceo then i'm thinking so how do i on the c level attack that that value that corporate value what is my part in that um and again i think today you know every company is collecting a shitload of data excuse my words but <laughs> yes um because you want to train your ai um and and for a, for software development especially you are you are building all these features so you need to be collecting data for every feature to train your ai do you really need all that data that is the question so my take on it was what what can we do as a cdo function what can my team start to look into to add value to sustainability both from an environmental perspective but also from a cost perspective because both can't be it's it's not good for your organization so that is where i actually started to t- look at this and i think it was wonderful because then you have a very tight connection to data quality coming from zensact um you know building software for self driving cars for volvo um you are collecting data your cars are driving around and you're collecting data so the question is for a car that has been just standing still parked or at a red light we're still collecting the data so what quality function can i have effectively that deletes that data and i don't need to push everything in so before i actually get my data from the cars and move it into my data storage i need to have a really good set of data quality tools um that effectively just delete and purge data that is not needed so so to unpack this uh, topic i mean like on the one hand side uh, the overarching driver is sustainability mm-hmm. and from sustainability we can go into the from a cdo perspective what the hardcore question for for a cdo or for for the it department to think about how can we be as uh, co2 friendly so to speak as possible yes. with the way we are doing our data processing yes so how can we how can we minimize uh, the the impact we are doing in terms of storing a lot of data yes. running super expensive uh, large language models in an un- unnecessary way etc exactly so so this is one part of this and the, of course there there's the cost related to that yes and then and then there is the there is another angle on this and that is coming into this from sustainability has led eu to push uh, new regulations and different frameworks on how we need to report on this and we come into the esg uh, uh, topic environmental social and governmental reporting where basically now frameworks are coming up how we need to collect very different data than we are used to in order to uh, tr- be transparent about our co2 footprint as an example yes and of course this now also hits the cdo uh, agenda because now it's not only about how the cdo can be more uh, uh insight c- driven c- c- co2 friendly but actually there it's a massive data collection and data processing project in the making here yes you know where from a cost perspective to do all this data collection in a in a manual way or in a in a in more traditional way uh, might be very very costly in terms of headcount versus driving very very p- professional data governance and very very professional data processing yes. so so for me the cost is in relation to and uh, and the topic is in relation to how do i how can i as a cdo work with the reduction of the uh, cdo uh, co2 footprint 
in our operation? Mm -hmm. And how can I, in such a cost-effective way, make sure we can do the governance reporting and data and another type of data collection we might not have done in the past that basically we need to... Uh, for a license to operate, so in in some in some cases now you're going to get fines and you're going to have yes. a, a revoked license to operate if you have not done your compliant ESG reporting. So that's my f this is like two angles to this topic. Like uh, we can go down into you know uh, uh, to what you're highlighting on on yeah. being smart of uh, of, of the life cycle of data, mm -hmm. but we can also go down in understanding. Uh, the data processing side of ESG reporting, which is massive. So that's an interesting topic we, and, and uh, uh, that we can kind of um, start with. But before we go much, much deeper into these topics, um, I just want to introduce you, Vanessa Ericsson, as the uh, podcast guest here at AI After Work. And super happy to have you here. And you've been uh, part of the uh, community for a long time. You are a uh, Dare Award winner. We yes. need to talk about that. Uh, in, uh, so also very recognized on, on a broader scale in the in the Nordic uh, data and AI community. You are, you are one of the first appointed CDOs, chief data officers in the Nordic region, and uh, you've been working with these topics both in uh, PwC, and then now you've had the role of CDO in Senseact, as you highlighted uh, for the last uh, three or four years, I guess. Yeah, three. Yeah, so. You know, welcome, Vanessa. And, Thank you. you. know, how would you sort of uh, very shortly describe yourself and then we can get back on to the, the real topics here? Um, yeah, I think uh, you've covered most of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm, I think I'm very passionate about working with data. Uh, you know, like you, I've been working with data forever. Um, and I think that... Um, It's it's almost uh, un, a, a bit surreal to think that I'm one of the first to be appointed uh, with the role. Uh, that was when I was working with Gartner. I was on the Gartner advisory board for several years. Um, and I worked with Deborah Logan in creating that, you know, the, the, the best practices and what should the role do. So uh, a solid background in what should a CDO really be doing? Very interesting. I know, I know Deborah. She she coined information as a second language, <laughs> I, I, or something like this, as a Gartner term. Yeah. But she's this, retired now. But that, well, this must be back in 2000, I don't know, 15? Yes, sixteen. Yes, yes, sixteen. Yeah, fantastic. So tell 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 us, like, um, what, what was the starting point? Being you know, when you started thinking about the CDO at this point in time, what what can you? What's the sort of highlights of, you know, what, what you came up with or th thought about or did at that point in time? So I, I think it's a lot. Uh, if, you, if you think way back when, because you had this defensive and offensive tracks and understanding then, so what should the CDO really be doing? Um, I think at that time it was also quite heavy on the whole data governance. Uh, companies could not understand, you know, what is it when you say ownership of data, what do you really mean? But I also, um, you know, stressing on the whole, the innovation part of it, continue with the POCs, um, keep looking for, for, for the solutions that will actually make a difference to your business. I think that that is still very relevant even today because the POC part and looking for, you know, um, the, what, can we, what more can we be doing with our data? That has to that has to be a, mi a missionary that just keeps churning out different solutions, but uh, I think today the whole um, everybody wants to be working with AI, and that's where my next big fast train. I see this big fast train coming because ten years ago it was data governance. I think the next fast train is the whole AI governance and how are we actually working with with our AI. And I think to connect it, I see, I think data leaders and, and you would also see the connection with data governance as well. AI governance and data governance, they go really hand in hand. What do you think? No, I, I fully agree. And, uh, and we can all agree upon that has been working in this field that without proper data governance or data proper uh, training data into our, our algorithms, we will struggle, right? And, yep. and so there are intensely connected mm -hmm. and uh, but but if we if we would um, very very quickly 
go, you just go down the small rabbit hole of separating data governance and AI governance. How how would we uh, together in a simple way? What is what here? Okay, so data governance for me is who owns it. You know, what are the processes? What are the rules that we have to work with our data? And then when we see, you know, um, looking at this, looking at the quality of the data. What is not working? Is it the IT systems? Is it the processes? What needs to be changed? Because then if we have an owner for our data, it goes, it's so much easier to just take it, take the issues back to the owner and say, this is it. This is not working. This is what we have identified. What do you want to do about it? Because coming again from an IT function or whatever, it doesn't work that way. You need to have who owns the data to address the issues. That for me is data governance. That is the, so. In, in a way, that is sort of a fundament that doesn't go away. No. But now we need to have that building block. And now, when we go into AI, our governance needs to expand in some other areas yes. in order to understand that the scope. This is still equally important. And without the foundation here, you will really struggle with the AI governance. And yes. you, I, I would argue you can't even do AI governance if you can't even have the starting point: who owns no. the data and who owns the algorithm. Absolutely. But 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 what are the next level now when we when we put the AI wrapper on top of that? How would you then add to that story? I think you know earlier this year I was a judge for the whole AI responsible AI uh, for the automotive industry, and that's where I I actually was. It was it was such an eye opener to understand. So how do you actually work with it? Because when you look at when you look at responsible AI, for example, it's not just you know pieces of data. Uh, who owns this? You're looking at the entire process and saying. So, for example, um, we are out there. Our cars are out there collecting data, right? For each feature, the, that process starts from. So, who's assigning the cars? Where are the cars? And, and and this is just an example I'm sharing with you, but it it starts right from the beginning. Where who's assigning my cars? Where are our cars going? Do we have it all covered, or am I only looking at Sweden? Am I, you know, do I have cars everywhere so that there are no biases in that process? Um, so it's you're looking at a complete process to say, am I really doing? responsible AI. So it's, am I going so fast that I'm missing any potential biases? Is it transparent enough? So somebody, whoever says that this is mine can actually explain, um, yes, why did the car stop? Or why did the car, if there was no reason, why did it move to the left or the right and not stay in the lane? That is where, you know, you will also you you get paid back because your customer will trust your product even better when you know that you are you can explain why my AI behaved in a certain way. So, so what you're doing now is a little bit taking the AI governance heading and breaking it down into three, four, five major areas. So, yep. so how we deal with how we how we deal with bias is is one core area yes. of AI government. Transpa transparency, transparency and explainability is another one. W yep. What other ones? And the account accountability. Accountability, exactly. And what do you mean with accountability? So I, I think it ties to, if I'm looking at my data model, who owns this? Because somebody, I mean, when shit happens, you know, I need to know, who can I go to and say, hey, you know, this was yours, either a feature team, a product team, because something needs to change, right? So let's say I've identified a bias. I need to know, so where is this? Which team do I actually take this back to, to say, by the way, this needs to be changed. Yeah, and, This and is not okay. So that's what I come with. Um, so who's accountable here? Because you can't go to a company and say, yes, you can go to a company, but then the company helps needs to help have help also in drilling down. So who owns this? But if, if I'm going to test if I understand you right now, mm -hmm. because if I if I link that back to a, a CDO function or a CDO role, and making this operational, going from PowerPoint and high level ideas to something that really works in a real company in real time, so to speak, like. The way I understand this, what you're saying now is that on the one hand side, you need to, f you need to highlight a 
let's start simple. Uh, in one way, you need to have ideas on policies and principles. What is good behavior? What is good practice? And what do we do and not do? So this is sort of now we are on sort of policy level. Yes. Then you need to ask the uh, question: Who or, or uh, who owns this? Mm -hmm. So now we need to get into a, a, a like an organizational topology where we basically to make this real start sorting on algorithm le level or data level. Yes. You know where who has the accountability around this topic, or who who do we go to fix this? And then ultimately, you need to take it to take it into operations. You need to take the topics of data governance and AI governance, not only as a policing activity at the end, but you need to put it all the way down into your core design processes or DevOps processes. Yes. So flipping it, so you do AI governance by design. So flipping it, so you do data governance by design. Yes. And, and now we have talked about that whole piece of the puzzle, how do we do that in a way uh, as a company, as an enterprise? Because the problem is if each different function has their own ideas on this, the holistically you're, you're not going to have interoperability and holistically you're not going to be tracing you know, the different algorithms that works with each other or the different data that works with each other. So someone needs to drive a common platform idea around this, even if you're working in different engineering teams and different autonomous teams. Is that a good, is that sort of... That, that is perfect. And I think that, that the CDO function then is the perfect place to run that, right? Because otherwise, I mean, so um, at SenseAct, I talk about my experience from SenseAct. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a startup, right? Uh, so you have, we're building the software um, and that is, it's the product and the product teams are working with the features. So then as a CDO function, how do you add value to the company and to the products? So build, building that platform, creating those processes, giving them the insights and helping them with that, both the data governance model, but also because the, the owners and the accountability will come from within the product area. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, we, we, we will be able to circle back all the way to ESG governance on, on, on going down these rabbit holes now. So we, let's stay here right now because there is one thing about understanding how this works in a tech startup. Mm -hmm. like, like, so in, in a sense here, here we have the environment where everybody in, in Senseact in some ways are working on a digital platform. Yes. Everybody's working on algorithms. Everybody's working on creating uh, autonomous software, autonomous vehicle drive, you know, software that they are now embedding and selling into Volvo as an OEM, uh, as an example. So the interesting point here is that all the different teams are sort of self-sustainable when it comes to data and engineers and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is how can they interact with each other and how can we have standards on a very, very granular level so that so so the they they holistically work together and effectively you can do this across the whole system. Yeah. And and I think th th this then highlights the difference between wh where we need to have platform, like let's let's say the CDO function has a, a central platform understanding mm -hmm. and how we then service this platform to different engineering teams or different domain teams and stuff like that. And I think this is one of the mistakes or misconceptions of what's the difference between the central teams and the and the real engineering teams doing work. That even if you have uh, very autonomous domain teams who can do their own someone is working on this algorithm, someone yep. is working on the UX and stuff like that. If they don't have interoperability, if they don't have governance translated into how they work with engineering or with machine learning, this whole holistic system will not work as no. one. It will no. be work as a, as a fragmented, uh, disparate silos. Yes, absolutely. So, so I think it is in, in, uh, in their interest to work with the CDO function and yeah. help, yes, and get the help. Yeah, because because in some ways now, this distinction between how the CDO acts as a provider and enabler, mm -hmm. whilst the actual engineering is done yes. in the one domain team, I think this can be sometimes 
misunderstood, if, especially if I go to more traditional companies. Mm-hmm. We are, then we are understanding ourselves as a business unit out here and a central IT function as an example. Yeah. But here we are actually, here the, the, the relationship is not so much in, in, in the same. It's some, someone has the platform responsibility, but we're not going to build it for you. The domain, the engineering team is going to build it within their domain, but someone needs to take care of the holistic governance, or which is, I think sometimes the governance word is misunderstood because we need to translate governance into hardcore standards in practices and patterns and protocols in order to do the right stuff. So for me, that... That misconception that we have a central platform team, or, or then you're building the central engineering pieces. No, we are, we are here to provide a platform for many other t- domain teams to be able to work together effectively. Do you follow that, that kind of misconception of central versus domain or platform versus domain, how it should be versus sometimes? Yes, I mean, and I think also, I absolutely agree with you, Henrik. Mm, I think also for a small company like a startup, like Zenzact, it is quite important that you have a central function helping you mm-hmm. because, because all of these engineers are there for another specific function, right? To to build the product, to build the software. Exactly. Yes. And there's and that's why so you have a CDO function, you have a CDO role, you have the, the organization there, a small organization, albeit, to help them to understand, but you have to have this synchronization between the CDO and the product teams because they are the experts in their areas, in their domains. So you need them nevertheless to work together with the CDO function because otherwise, I mean, for us, coming there as a CDO function, there's no way I me or my team would know so what features and what are we doing in here that's the the closeness and the collaboration cooperation we need to have with them uh to get the most out of what uh, the work that we're doing but would you would you then if i try to put the word on the on on this on on the identity of the cdo function would you understand the cdo function as an enabling function for the domain to do their work but ultimately do it in a platform way so it flows or do you would you put another uh, word or do you see what i mean with the name as an enabling to see themselves as an enabling function yes i uh, i think i would agree with that yeah because having said that if if I if I back the tape up to 2015, 16, mm. at that point in time, even Gartner, we were talking about uh, operation uh, centers of excellence. And we were doing different types of uh, models of how to organize so everything centralized or everything uh, decentralized or in a hub and spoke model. Yeah. And if I re- go back to where we were in 2016, 17, there, there was this idea that we're going to build an, a, a, a central AI team. We're going to build a central data team. And basically we were going to do the stuff for them. And then we're going to have only consumers and no engineers, so to speak, out in the domains. And and this storytelling I'm doing now has very little to do with a, a tech company like Senseact, but more about how, how this was understood in the I remember those days. Yes. The traditional <laughs> enterprise world, right? The problem here was that when we put the story, that's not an enablement team anymore. That is actually a central team taking over the job to build the algorithm. And the problem w- with that model in the end turned out, in my opinion, that the central team was too far away from the domain problem. Yeah. And then for the, we had these ping pong games, whispering games going on, and we, we we started building up data science team or data engineering teams, but they were not close enough to the problem. I mean, like, and and and, it, and if you flip that to how it really works in a tech startup like Senseac, that's vastly different. Yes. So I think they have the product teams are the ones responsible for building, you know, their their algorithms and whatever they need. Uh, the software, their their product. We are working together with them to understand. So what is it? So one of the things that we did was, um, you know, from the start we were looking at Jira to say, so where are we? How good are we? How are we measuring our productivity? Um, and that's where we invested in the talent platform. Yeah, yeah. To to, to get the data from 
from the GitHub and, you know, other sources to put that together to say, okay, so what are the different features? Where are we? For example, I mean, um, because I think that would be a little overwhelming for the product teams to go out and start doing that, right? Because over here also, it's not just about the product team. Um, as a CDO function, you have the people um, insights as well, the people data. Yeah. Where are people? What are the resources? What are the skills that we need to be developing more? You have the finance data as well. So a CDO function is not just about the product data. As an example, you have a lot of other data that the teams then, the data scientists or whoever you have in your team, putting that data together to say, to give the company in back insights. Yeah, because... What- Because if you think about it, each product team has a subset understanding of the talent they need and um, the cost of running maybe their small part. Yeah. But they are not charged with having the enterprise understanding for this. So so when you're trying to take a more strategic look at how do we invest and prioritize mm-hmm. what talent to hire and stuff like that, and uh, what sourcing do we need, uh, what tool sets do we need, Uh, you get a very fragmented picture of that if if you only ask and you're trying to collect that uh, manually or, or uh, you know, uh, through with each product team. And what you're saying now is that to holistically steer the resource allocation and the cost and yes. understanding this, you need to, you need, someone needs to take a step back and see, okay, when we put all the pieces to, of the puzzle together what does from, it look like? from 10 product yes. teams, what does it actually look like? I mean, yeah. a good example can be, oh, I will hoard my data. Yes. Oh, it's, it's just, it's just a couple of terabytes that I'm doing. Yeah. But when you put that next to each other, all of a sudden, you know, for a startup, yeah. that could be the burn rate <laughs> that goes through the window. In, yeah. in, in, in And I think sometimes that information is not available or it does not... Nobody perceives it, right? If you are not on that level in the organization, you are, so, sorry to say, if you are a developer and you're just, you know, you've got your code to create and, and continue to develop it, that insight of, uh, by the way, I'm holding a lot of data and this is costing the company, it doesn't, it's not automatically that you get that. No, and it's quite logical because someone in their domain has one KPI and one goal yes. to build as good product or algorithm as possible. And they have sharp deadlines to get that done. That's what they're measured at. At the same point in time, someone needs to look at the holistic picture. What is this platform actually consuming? How is this platform actually evolving? Is it evolving now? I can realize that we have two different teams and they go out and buy different products to do the same thing, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so for me, The first understanding of, of, to really understand the CDO function, you need to start, stop thinking central versus uh, local, and you need to think platform versus domain. Because just by doing that, so that when you have a central team, you say, oh, we're going to put, we're going to put the actual use case in the central data warehouse in the central. So this is, this is still looking at things, but just moving them one way. When we take platform versus domain, We, sh- we are shifting the way we're understanding the, the responsibilities and looking at it from a different lens. Do you see yes, what I mean here? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you agree with that uh, simple it, analogy? Yes. I mean, and even though it was a startup, I mean, that's pretty much what we, what the way we worked, right? Because you've got the different domains. Yeah. You collect all that data and say, okay, so what do we look like? How, how good are we? Yeah. What are, what do we still need to be focusing on? What needs to be taken out? What the, because it's not obvious that to everybody else that maybe we shouldn't be doing all these that we we want to be doing. Yeah, but I'm going to test another idea. Then mm-hmm. I think there's a vast difference between understanding this quite naturally in a tech startup. Asensiac that essentially is a platform company with a lot of different domains and microservices in relation to a, a fully autonomous system platform. So from birth, this company kind of understands that uh, separation of uh, concerns between platform and domain. Yeah. When I go to the, the most traditional enterprises, They have come from, they have not sliced the mandates and relationship 
like horizontally, like domain versus platform, they rather looked at this is end-to-end the full stack in a local system versus this is end-to-end the whole use case, the whole shaboom in a central system. And we, we, we are then looking at how should I put it, silos that are sort of thinner in, a, in, in one local business unit versus uh, silos that are bigger, which is maybe serving a, a larger community that, that belongs in a central function. So we actually, we are, we, are, we, are, we are not slicing the relationship platform versus domain. We are, we, are, we are used to slicing responsibilities, local system versus central systems, end to end with the use case, with the project, you know. Yeah. So, and I think... The CDO function has, I think the CDO function either way needs to work platform versus domain, but the journey to do that when you have central versus local as the starting point yeah. is way different. Yes. And I think that's the role of the CDO yeah. to, to be talking to this, the, you know, the peers, yeah. um, giving them that business case, teasing them with what are the potential, what are the opportunities uh, missed opportunities yeah. uh, and getting the buy-in from all of them and, and perhaps the board as well. Yeah. So how would you picture your sort of uh, work or how would you summarize, you know, to, to make it more concrete, uh, the CDO role work that you did now most recently in Sensi Act? So h- how would you describe what, what that job was on a daily basis or like, you know, you know, who did you talk to? What did you, what, what was sort of on your agenda as a CDO? So um, it was not the chief data here at Sensite, it was chief digital. And yeah. uh, my responsibilities were data, uh, IT and uh, cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, and data, like I just said, was um, putting all, looking at data from, from the entire organization. So it was the people data, the finance data, product data, I mean, everything that we could get. And then since we were sharing the data together with Volvo, uh, working together with them as well to understand, so what do we, you know, what does the roadmap look like? Uh, and especially since um, we also are st- were established, we still are, they still are, I don't work with them anymore. Uh, in China, you know the, the laws in China, you can't move any data out. So (laughs) that brought a complete new dimension with federated learning, Uh, working together with AI Sweden. uh, I was the chairman of the project. So it was Volvo Car, Zenzact and AI Sweden in understanding, so what can we do? And there it's still very much, you know, uh, theory. But how do we, how could we use federated learning uh, coming up rather soon uh, in moving that data? Um, from a cybersecurity perspective, it was both uh, cybersecurity, you know, protecting our product, the software, but also in the company, because I mean that that's a complete new ball game as well, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're a software company, understanding that by the way, you can't download your code and take it home. Uh, you know, <laughs> exactly <laughs> something as small as that, getting your employees to understand in a fun way, in a in a in a way that is not intrusive or, you know, in, a, in, in the most polite way, how could you ex- help your employees understand? That was also quite a challenge. Uh, and then from an IT perspective, it is t- just having the, the most up-to-date t- tools in the building, keeping the, you know, the offices running and also working from home yeah. uh, conditions. So I think that I absolutely loved my job. Uh, at, but there, there, there's, there, there's a big variety when you put the uh, digital officer and you have the core dimension of security yes normal it and then data data yes but you have to have good people right people that you trust uh working in your management team how did you organize your management team so we i had an engineering manager um i had a head of data um head of cyber security um i had a cio role reporting to me yeah, so the CIO role in this setup yes. is actually part of reporting into the CDO. Yes, yeah. And the CIO role is then what can we refer to as, as more traditional? I mean, yes. we need a lot yes. of office management. We need our teams, we yes. need our uh, file storage yeah. for you know, all this. Yeah. 
access management the, for, for our employees, et yes. cetera, et cetera. Yes. So the CIO reported to yeah. me. And had that had that part. Yeah. 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 That's so, an interesting one. Yeah. You know. And it was fun. I think it worked because it was a small company. So um but I'm I'm guessing in a in a bigger in a in a normal enterprise company organization, I think that would be a little overwhelming to have cybersecurity and data and um um and IT. But how how what what Based on your learnings all the way back from Gartner and working with Deborah to PwC and then now into uh, Sensi Act, what is the understanding for how to organize or where to place the CDO function, in your opinion? In, if if I've, I need to frame that, I would give one answer if we are in a startup. I would potentially give another answer in a hyperscaler like Klarna or Spotify. And I would give a third answer, most likely, if I look at a more traditional enterprise. So let's start with a traditional enterprise. So let's let's, let's take a a Swedish bank or a Swedish manufacturing company uh, that has probably then a CIO for many, many years back. You know, and they haven't really maybe had a digital officer or a data officer, and now they're thinking about it. Mm. So, wh- how would you think about this for the for the traditional enterprise, so to speak? I think this role absolutely has to be on the C level. So it's not just giving them the CDO, you know, title and then pushing them down to report to the, C- the CIO or CTO or something like that. Uh, and that is the journey. That is the fight that I took. Um, years ago while I was at Telia yeah. because I got questioned, what's in a role? And I said, okay, I'm going to take mm-hmm. your CFO title off and I just call you head of finance. What's in a role, right? What's in a role? Because if you give somebody the responsibility of a chief data officer, then also try to understand, so what is the mandate you're giving this, uh, this role? Uh, what are the expectations as well? Because I think today a lot of companies hire a CDO and they expect everything to be done, everything to be fixed. Um, I think where they lose their patience is because you will accept that um, you you need to have your foundation in place. Uh, I think AI is the new, you know, like, Orange, what is it? Orange is the new black. Uh, AI, a- AI, AI is, the, is new black. the new, yes, it's the <laughs> new sexy thing to do. And of course, everybody wants to be in that space. But understanding that if you do not have your proper data quality, data governance in place, there's just going to be a lot of capital S, H-I-T on top there, right? But so, but but what, one of the objections that, that I've heard and seen is like, okay, so how many C-suites should we have? If we have a chief data officer, should we now have a chief AI officer next to it? or And how should we relate now? So, so for me, the confusion starts, and I think that's why we have a lot of challenges. Like if, I, if we look at the US, for instance, the average length of the tenure of a CDO is fairly short. And I think it has a lot to do with misaligned expectation understandings yes. of the mandates and the roles. And we, we put the role in place, as, but as you said, we didn't give the arena for that role to, to work. And I think that whole thinking about what is the real arena, how does it fit with the other roles, you know, I think this is yeah. confusing Absolutely. For, for many Absolutely. And I, I think that when they are hiring a CDO, because I usually say, um, you know, by the way, I'm not an engineer. You know that, right? And I'm not a, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not coming there because, you know, it's you're asking for a leader or you're asking for somebody to, you know, sit down there and, and work with your code. So I think the, the expectations from organizations also, or you can challenge your headhunters that reach out to you because this is really headhunters who are coming. Yeah. So helping them to understand what is the kind of profile that you should be looking for. Yeah, but, and, and then I think it goes one step back as mm-hmm. well. What is it that you need? What is the gap that you're filling? And what is the gap that is, what, what is logical for the CIO to do? And then now it's actually not maybe logical for the CIO to do this. I'm not so sure this is clear uh, no. or understood or, or at, at least there's, 
there are many opinions on this <laughs> as it is consultants or experts. Yeah, and I think that um, um, I think that this role needs to be working very closely with a CIO function. Yeah, uh, because it's understanding then. But why you know, is it a different function? What, what the is the CDO? Yeah, yeah, because the because the IT. I mean, if you think traditional IT, I don't think they are interested in. Uh, data and data quality they're not th- those things are not on their agenda it's platforms it's you know it's it making sure it's working and that's where you can have a lot of synergies if the ch- cdo and the cio or cto work together because put your i mean the cdo can put the requirements to a cio function to get your platforms or whatever work together with them but the CDO is really more data driven, making sure that the whole governance is in place. The, and then the insights are then collecting the requirements from the businesses so that you can, you know, be the enabler, like you talked about earlier, right? The enabler to the rest of the organization. But okay, so l- let's, let's dissect this a little bit, because let's say you, ha- you, are, you, you have had a CIO for a long time. And within the CIO space, you've had your ERP systems, you have you had your office IT, mm-hmm. you know, so you have your transactional systems. And and then maybe you've had in the past some reporting and some data warehousing. And all of a sudden now, in order to at, at all succeed with AI, even in the smallest form, you need to start moving into the modern data stack. And now, how do you understand who owns, oh, let, let's, let's then personify that with sort of maybe the cloud vendors or whatever that is and, and some... You know, typical vendors we see at Data Innovation Summit, <laughs> you know, but that feels tools and, and, and technologies for the modern data stack. Is the toolbox or the architecture of the toolbox part of the CIO role? Or is it that a distinction between sort of ERP toolbox and and and, uh, and and the CDO on the other side? So how how will the CIO and CDO work if I now move completely into uh, OLAP, online analytical processing, the, so the data processing. Can we can we work on the data governance and data management side without actually flipping it into hardcore engineering practices, which in that case needs to be flipped into the technology choices you have made as an engineering team? Is there, is there really a clear-cut answer to that? No, that's what I'm... I, no. I, I think it's a super... <laughs> I don't cl- think so. I because think it, I think it, it actually... It's it's every organization and understanding how they are set up. Yep. And then also, because over here, for me, you know, I put a lot of people values first. And I think if you have a fantastic relationship with the CIO or CTO, you know, work together and see what is the model that fits best for for that organization. But I I think that if the CIO is somebody that has been running it for so long, the CDO is brand new and because that's really what it looks like today, right? Companies, yes. it's, It's a brand new role, you're setting it up. You know, there's so much to do for this for the brand new CDO. So don't take on a mountain, you know, fix first what needs to be done as the enabler. What's your quick win? I don't think your quick win is going and pulling the ERP system or something from the CTO. So give him also that respect, give him or her that respect and say, you know, keep this. Let, let's let sort out, Ria, you know, what are the quick wins? What do I really need to do first to get the buy-in from the people? Because again, the CTO is often shot down, right? So you have to create a, f- a fantastic, my first 100 days, what exactly am I doing? Do not put in taking away, you know, from the CTO or CIO. I think this is brilliant advice because we know, if I take the traditional enterprise, yep. that you have a legacy organization and legacy mandates and legacy setups that are there. And now we we we, we are understanding to a, a shallow level, I would argue, that we need a CDO. Yeah. So the first thing you need to do as a CDO for your first 100 days, so to speak, yes. build your arena in co-creation and collaboration exactly. with the critical stakeholders. So basically be very, very smart here of, you know, taking on the stuff that sort of hasn't landed yet and the stuff that has landed. Great. We collaborate on this. Exactly. I love it. Yes. Because I mean, and you'll have plenty of time if you feel like later on, okay, you know, and it's also the relationship you build with this person. So if you think that, okay, you know, what should I take now? Are you happy still working with all this? I'm happy as well because the CDO, there's so much you can do. 
But the, but the key advice here is actually the, the profound, simple advice that you cannot clear out the mandate of the CDO on your own or in isolation. No. You need to understand how your mandate looks like in relation to technology, in relation to infrastructure, in relation to old technology, new technology, and then come up with a joint view on this. Yes. And where basically it makes sense because, phew, finally someone is taking on these topics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So that that is the simple advice, and and that will of course look different depending on the maturity and the journey of any company. So if I if you put in a CDO where they haven't started with the modern data stack, you only have old ERP systems. You yeah. have only yeah. old on-prem data warehouses. Yes. Then maybe you need to take on more on the tech side, so yeah. to speak. Yes. But if you come to a place like I, I can say both Vattenfall and Scania or whatever company that has been on the big data journey since 2012, 13, 14, then the, then the story is different, how you, how you frame out the chief digital officer or chief data officer role. Yeah. I, I like that advice. Very Thank good. Thank you. I'm happy to give. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean, like, so this is, this. if I'm taking a step back now, our conversation today, we were in the midst of a conversation on ESG reporting, enterprise and social governance. And, from there, we, we kind of very fast slipped into the rabbit hole of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the chief data officer. Yes. And, and, and the interesting segue now is, you know, connecting this circle back a little bit is that um, if you look, let me try to frame it. If you look at ESG reporting, it basically states by compliance laws and new laws coming out of EU that you need to collect data and report on data, which has uh, which falls under the headings of uh, environmental and social and governance topics. And there are several different frameworks. And in this is coming into effect, I would say already in two, 2024, because in reality, we need to we should report in 2025 on these topics in, in most of the frameworks. But in order to report in 2025, you need to have collected the data yes. in 2024. So it's you can't really wait with this problem uh, no. until 2025 because then you had, you don't have any data for, for January. So, so from January 2024, data needs to start be collected. And ultimately we have a year to form what I see as a new function almost on the, of the same caliber as, as a finance function doing the financial reporting. And to me, um, I mean, like you start off trying to understand what ESG is and what the framework says and what are the KPIs and what are the metrics and how do you calculate that? And that's, what, that's what's been sort of going on for the last year. And, and, and especially the management consultants have been very good at advising and knowing these frameworks really well. But I think right now, right now, or maybe this spring, it fully hits home that in the end, the data collection and the data processing part will be a massive part of this governance or actually this cost. So when you go to ESG reporting and you, you're now starting to collect a lot of operational data, mixing it with finance data, mixing it with uh, social data or, or calculations you're supposed to do, it's a fairly complicated data management topic. And for, and this is now the segue. I think the CDO function is one of the main players in any, or, or, or head of data, head of analytics is a super big, important player in order to cost effectively solve ESG. So that is the frame. So now we're sort of connecting back that, yes. how can the CDO be part of this game? How do you see this uh, framing at it now? Absolutely. I mean, and I think that this is so important, right? Because you will have legal teams. Uh, and I think that is also, um, you you will have legal um, involved with you somehow, helping you on this journey. And and I think the CDO function, because now you're collecting data, as we talked about in the past, uh, earlier, um, you have data from all the different domains or the areas. So you have complete insight into helping your legal teams and your compliance teams to put these reports together to send in. Yeah, and, and, and let's really 
dig into that domain topic because I think this has not this hardcore problem has not really dropped all the way to what it means because when you take uh, ESG ES uh, um, reporting, I mean, like um, if you are in 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 one of those. Um, heavy abate type industries. So we have mining, we have transport, we have a couple of manufacturing where that, that sort of, they are in the focus of yes. this law. They need to collect data from the, you know, to try to calculate CO2 as an example, or in the mine, in the logistics, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the offices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden now we have, very, very operational data that belongs in one particular function or domain in a, in a company that needs to be now fed in and understood into a larger context. So, so it becomes virtually impossible for an ESG team on the top that knows the, you know, so you have a team that really knows the ASG KPIs and metrics. So they know what they should send in. Yeah. But in order to sort out which data they need to join and put together, you need super duper deep domain knowledge from many, many different domain functions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is different to financial reporting because the financial reporting, you stay a lot more within the financial model of a company. And here we need to mix data from vastly different data yes. models. So the, this from is the logistics month. team, you get, you get, I mean, the guys driving the trucks outside. Um, there was a company called uh, In River uh, oh. that is also, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of companies that are also riding off on this, right? Uh, and I think In River has a good solution for this reporting. So, um, but but I, I want to stay with what you started there because this is a multi domain problem, multi-data model problem. So we have logistics, right? And within logistics, you will have your data model to understand the logistics business. Within the manufacturing plant, mm -hmm. they will have a di different data model that is relevant for operating the, the manufacturing plant. Within finance, you have the data model around your the, your finance model of cost and, and, and all this. And then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now you need to model the data and understand exactly what data on the logistics side, together with the manufacturing side, together with the finance side, and you need to understand where to do the join, and you need to understand that. So, so the like, so if I put a new reporting team as an ESG reporting team on on top here, there there is no physical way that the ESG reporting team can know all these different data models. Absolutely not. So here now. Within finance, you could kind of solve it within one operating function of finance and they knew their taxes and they knew their general ledger, they knew the common shot of accounts, but it's all within one fundamental data type. Here we are moving across many different data types mm -hmm. that you need to have domain modeling first, understanding what data that needs to move to the sort of consuming domain of ESG. I think this is way more data governance, data management intensive than what Absolutely. we've done before. Absolutely. And I think it'll take a lot more from an organization perspective to try and get these both. I, I can e easily see a head of ECG with then, you know, people um, kind of when you talk about the hub and spoke, I mean, yep. perhaps something like that from all the other different domains as well, because then they are the ones with the knowledge from their areas um, feeding into this ESG, head of ESG to then reports, you know, gives it or hands it works together with the legal or uh, with the CDO function to put this report together. Yeah. And, and so, so let's, let's work on that hypothesis. I, I, I think something like that will happen. Now, right now we are scrambling on used to collect the data and we build projects around that. And we are thinking more like projects used to get the stuff done. Yeah. But if I go into operations and I'm going to do periodical reporting on this, mm -hmm. I need to find a way to organize the people doing the right things in the data value chain, yeah. literally from the sensor yes. to the report. Yes. So I think if I understand this, not only as, you know, I'm going to collect the data once, but I'm going to have an operating function that is doing this data processing where no one can understand the full model. Mm. That becomes a team topology of people who needs to work within the domain to do certain things. 
maybe someone needs to work in some sort of a, a collection and, and, and validation interface and someone yep. needs to work in the reporting place. Yep. So you really, you really go out of Power BI and the reporting tool, hardcore down into uh, data collection, data storage, data processing, and you, you, you're ending up, if you're trying to do that as a monolithic warehouse, I think it's going to be very, very hard to have anyone to understand the full model. So uh, uh, this is driving more modern data architectures, like we talk data mesh, data fabric, or whatever we are talking about. It's it's not going to be easily solved in a monolithic no. data warehouse. No. So I think we have a lot of work ahead of us. We have a lot of work ahead Some of us. Some exciting stuff as well. <laughs> yeah, but... Think about this. Is ESG a reporting problem or is e ESG a data provisioning problem? So what I mean with that is where will the cost incur to develop this and to operate this? Will you, If you set up this structure in the wrong way, you will have a lot of manual overhead simply to collect the data and, and do that uh, on, on a daily basis. That is uh, a really good question. So, so we're now looking at this as a reporting problem mm -hmm. and of course we do that because we need to understand the regulations yeah but to solve it in the most cost effective way what is the where will the cost or the money be spent to op to build it and operate it i i propose to you that from a cost perspective where the money will flow in order to set this up and to operate this will be data processing so basically it's a data provisioning problem at its core yeah. more than uh, okay we need to know exactly what the domain needs and they what they need but when we figure that out then we need to flip it to a cdo topic is my simple view on this i totally agree i absolutely really interesting but could you elaborate a little bit then on uh, what do you think uh, how should the cdo act here or how can he be part you know is he even invited to the table yet well, that's why you need a kick-ass like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, uh, you, you know, you're saying something that is quite relevant. It's not always that the CDO is invited. And then, and then you have to get more agitated and aggravated about it. Because if you have a CDO in place, why are you not inviting the CDO to the table, right? Especially if you're discussing data issues. Um, no, I, I think that also... Um, starts to look like more cost function. You know, you're just using, you're just spending. So uh, I, I think that with the ESG, the, with the rules coming in place, where we had GDPR, right? And yep. that brought about also a, a more advanced or push for whole data governance. Um, I think with the whole, this, this ESG reporting, um, I think the CDO has a very good, uh, uh, a good, it, the CDO could actually position himself or herself in the right way of, you know, being the enabler, getting this information, creating this to add value to the organization. Because yeah. it's something like, like you said, it's not going to go away. You're going to be, you're going to have to report. I do not think that every function itself is going to be, or the ESG as a standalone, the ESG could also report to into the finance area, right? Because in some organizations, you, that's what you have. But since it is so much data collection to understanding, are we compliant? Um, it should, it, I think that the CDO should be a very natural person to go to for this function together with legal and compliance. Yeah, and, and let's elaborate on another angle here that I think also puts the CDO how he can uh, use this. Because if you think carefully now, we, we have the compliance lever with ESG to start collecting and creating beautiful data sets, trusted data sets that are clearly trusted to be used by EU, mm -hmm. that we then can free up if we have done this in a good way to be used for other use cases. So I think if we elaborate this and, you know, the whole defensive versus offensive strategy that we talked about as the CDO. So imagine if, help me here, imagine what's the 
offensive possibilities if the CDO is part of this game and not only cleaning it up for the use of ESG, but it's actually cleaning it up in such a way, productizing it in such a way, so you can then use it for your AI algorithms, as an example. It's a win-win. It's a win-win, right? But but what is the storytelling then? How would you advise the CDO to sort of pitch this sort of thing? So basically making a a, a lemon into lemonade, so to speak. I think there is no... I'm sorry. I don't think there's any sugar coating it. ESG is going to be... It's coming your way. Yeah. So, you know, get in the game. But I think that the the... the is exactly as you say. I mean, you. This is something you have to do. Position yourself in the right way so that you you're getting the mandate to run this from a data perspective. Yes. Uh, uh, because, I mean, I can imagine that uh, it depends uh, on on every company and how the setup is. But, um, you know, the companies that I've worked with, the compliance function were reported to the CFO, but. Uh, and that would, I, I can imagine that that some companies that it would, that would be a very nice way of reporting as well. But if it is a data function, f- get your foot in. Yeah. Um, the CDO needs to get the foot in, work together with the compliance teams. And uh, I think that that is the sugar coating is that, you know, your business case, if you do this, it affects this, this and this, all the other things. So... So imagine the pitch is simple. You have a compliance topic that you need to get on it or yes. you, your license is not You have a compliance need. You have a compliance need. So how can I turn the lemon of the compliance need to an opportunity to yes. accelerate our data and AI data processing maturity and use these data sets for other use cases? That's the sugar coating. That's yes. the lemonade that you... With the data same that you can trust. Data that you can trust that we send to EU mm. is now available to consume for other use cases. That's yeah. how you sugarcoat yeah. it. And then like you'd it. also get your whole AI, you know, the trustworthiness as well, the transparency. Yes. So it, it has to be a win. And I think yeah. that that is one way of actually embracing it. Because in, instead of pushing it off and saying, you know, oh, this you see this awful workload coming your way, if you turn it around to say that, wow, here's the opportunity because we can then attack the, you know, the transparency, exactly. the biases, exactly. the quality. There are so many things you can get with the same stone. So what we're saying, invest in this topic in a way so it can be used for many other, so you basically addressing some of the core issues that you've been struggling with as, 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 a, as an enterprise working exactly. on a data platform. Yes. Uh, that, that's a very, very, that's, the, that's a simple value proposition in the end, I think, if you can tell the story in, in the right way. Yes. All right. That's, that's, I think now we, now we, did, we did the whole full circle uh, from ESG to CDO, back yes. to ESG, back to pitching as a CDO. I love that. Yeah. I want to cover at least one more topic before we uh, close for today. And I want to cover the topic, the entry point into this topic to me is how do we build, completely new topic, how do we build inclusion and diversity into our tech industry and into our tech part of our companies? Both why this is so important and then, uh, you know, how we can do it. And then actually that's the segue into talk also about girls in tech. Yes. So this kind of topic, I would like to start broad and then lead that into girls in tech. So why is this important with inclusion and, and uh, diversity and ultimately more women uh, in tech roles? Yeah. So I recently met a CEO of um, 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 a building construction company um, and Real estate, that's the word I was looking for, real estate. And she told me there's a lot of women in the real estate, Vanessa. And she questioned, does it have to be, you know, equal, equal? And I actually had to think about it. Does it have to be? You know, maybe you got more women in there and, and overall in the, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it all, add, it all adds up and it makes sense. But I think that having... You know, um, diversity in in tech or diversity in the real estate. The way we work is so different. The way we think is so different. 
it's quite amazing, really, because, you know, I come with a different set of ways of thinking and skills compared to you, Henrik. I mean, you have a different way of thinking about it, and I come with a different angle to it. And I think just here in this in, in this little chat, it's so it's Obvious. so wonderful, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So imagine the benefits organizations would be making if you actually encouraged half and half or, you know, a, a bigger, um, more women at the table uh, because it, it you have a different way of thinking of it. Because otherwise, if we were all women in here, we all thought about it this way, how boring would that be? Yeah, but uh, I think it's much, I think you're spot on. I mean, like, because you can you can think about this. If you're a very homogenous team, mm. the imagination of how you can solve a problem stays within the frame of one type of idea and one direction because yes. we're all groomed in the same way. Yes. And if you have diversity, you will have other ideas or someone will come up with a completely different understanding of the problem and therefore a different understanding of the solution. So, so step one, how can you have good innovation and not be stale if you if you in the end only have groupthink? You know? Exactly. So this is number one. I, let me test me another angle on why this is so important. It scares me a little bit that with the tech giants and the tech industry and how we build code and how we build a large, like, the, you know, what, what is really pervasive and it's changing the course of the world. We've seen it with social media. We think it's going to happen with AI and generative AI. It's quite scary to think that it's a very, very homogenous, small group of profile of people who sort of imagines something that will impact everyone. So if I think about it, like the 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 the, uh, the caricature, the the tech startup guy from Silicon Valley. It's the guy. He's uh, he's in a certain age, and he works in a certain uh, way, and they have a certain lingo in Silicon Valley. To me, that is not diversity. <laughs> so 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 thinking about that on on a grander scale, everything we can do in order to have the people building the future. Um, be represented by the people living in society, that should be a good thing. I, I agree. Yeah. I basically think, you know, yes, there's a lot of explanations. There's a lot of research that has gone into why there should be diversity. Yeah. For me, it's plain and simple. You know, I, I don't want to be this, the only woman at the table. So I'm, putting my foot down and making sure there are more women also with me at the table. That's and very basic. Very, very, very basic. I mean, because yes, like they, you know, you get so much material of research being done of why this is good and you've got good examples. Yes, there is. But, but I, I think it's up to each and every one of us what's the change we want to make. And, and that's why I decided six years ago, I'm going to make a change. Um, and I started Girls in Tech. And, and Girls, is, and, Girls in Tech was uh, just started in Stockholm. Um, what What is Girls in Tech? I was at a Women in Tech event here in Stockholm. Um, you know, it's a sellout in a couple of, a few minutes. Yes, and I I was there. I had a ticket, and I went there, and I saw women. Uh, you know, really excited, pumped up women in this entire auditorium. And I looked around and I, I don't know, I felt like, Phew, what is this? We have missed the mark. Because if you're looking for women in tech, am I inspiring more women that are already clearly, uh, they want to be here. They are women in tech. How will I get a proper flow of these exactly. women, constant women? I thought, you, I don't need to inspire you. You already got this. I need to go to the school. Exactly. I need to tell my kids, uh, you know, hey, go take tech. because. Um, so I did it for the sustainable flow of women someday because otherwise, if we only focus on those, on the women at the women in tech events, which are needed, so I'm not saying that don't don't crush me because I'm not saying that no. <laughs> not needed. they are needed. But 
I think it's looking at the younger generation, inspiring them, motivating them to take tech. Yeah, but but to me, this is so good, and it's actually uh, addressing two different problems. The, 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 the one is addressing that we have that we're getting more women in tech into more senior leadership roles, mm-hmm. and that we are th- 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 that our voices are heard here and now. But that doesn't fix the underlying problem. How do we get the fundamental flow that is yeah. more balanced? And we can have uh, as many people asking us, you know, why don't we have more uh, women on, on AI after work? Why don't we have more women speakers at Data Innovation Summit? And the hardcore reality is that when you look at who is educated and who got the job, the percentage of women, uh, uh, like th- that's the one we need to change. Yeah. And that's what I think you are doing with, with Girls in Tech. Yeah. So h- how does it work? Um we go to schools and we inspire school girls in classes seven, eight, nine, and then we hold events. So we get companies to work together with us, showcase their innovation and have the girls come to these events. They get to touch, they get to feel, they get to ask questions. Um, um, today we also have mentoring so they can sign up uh, and we have mentors that um, get previously checked by us to make sure that they are they have the right skills also to be mentoring. Um, we're looking at PROW. We're helping with PROW places because we know that some of the girls, they are challenged. Yeah, PROW yeah. is uh, when, you, when you go in school in, in some sort of, uh, what, what, what yeah. would be English? Uh, it's cla- English. classes eight. When you're in class eight, you have to get work-life experience. Uh, it's For a couple part, of weeks, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, the kids, if they don't get places, then they just go to uh, whatever, uh, go and sit in your dad's job or your mom's <laughs> job. So we, we want to help them also in that. Um, so all this time for the last six years, the mission has been just to motivate and inspire. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were in, interviewed, my co-founder and myself, uh, Ulrika Anderson. Um, we were interviewed by DN. Um, because, and, and that's, it, that was perfect because we then looked at, so what is the bigger mission? And the bigger mission for us is to make the Nordics, the, you know, the place leading with diversity. But, and, and how can anyone listening to this help out? Because if you want to do this right, there is a massive effort here. Yes. And the, this is a nonprofit I have understood. Yes. Yeah, but even if it's a nonprofit, you need to commercially be sustainable in yes. order to to and to even to ramp this up. Yes. I would argue that you have you scratched the surface of you know you could do it uh, so much more. You know, do more events, do more uh, regional events of the same thing, or do yes. even other things. And and, and this, how, how have you succeeded or to to sort of fund this or sort of what are you looking for if someone wants to help out? So all this time it has been through charity, uh, the, the well, you know, people mean well, uh, yeah. and, and just do it, uh, as, uh, from the goodness of their hearts, but you're absolutely right. We, we have noticed now after six years that if we want to get to the bigger mission, it's not enough what we're doing. So we are, we'll, we're starting a fundraising event. Uh, it will be launched in October. Um, so, you know, reach out to, reach out to me, uh, reach out to Ulrika. Because we I, have a Girls in Tech webpage, Girls in Tech Nordics webpage. So you can always get to the webpage and just reach out to us. Funding is fantastic and well you needed. Should have, you should have sponsors. You should have proper yes. partners. The, the tech vendors, the sponsors, they have a, in my opinion, an obligation to support you if yes. they, if they stand behind diversity not just with words, but with action. They, then we need to have sponsors that leads to this. Agree. Uh, uh, so that's how, uh, you know. And you have sponsors, um, of course. We, yes. Of course. We have sponsors in kind. Yeah. Yes. But this can be scaled up, of course. Yes. And yeah. that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Well, time flies. And, Indeed. And uh, I just want to... Um, d- Finish off on a little bit more personal note. You know, what's uh, next in your life? What 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 are you looking to do next? Because I, you know, wh- where are you right now in your in your 
life yeah. and, and, you know, short term, you're going to go to an event or ma mingle maybe today, but, <laughs> yes. but you know, the next, what, what are you looking for? What do you yeah. want? So I started my own advisory, um, within the data space, of course, uh, yeah. what is closest to my heart, but of course, um, you know, I've not really done the whole consulting bit before. So, um, anyone who is listening to this and wants help, <laughs> Perfect. You know, is is welcome. But at the same time, I'm also, I think I'm open for newer challenges. So if there's a company also looking for a CDO, yeah. you know, an old timer like me yeah, yeah. Uh, with, yes. And by the way, we, we, we already had a couple of things to talk about yes. that we figured out <laughs> right before the, the, the port started. So exciting yeah. times. Exciting times indeed. Thank you, Henrik. Thank and you Gora. very much.